all votes within the existing system are are really a vote to who gets more of the theft that comes from you. It's just theater. It's complete theater. Now let's go back to 5,000 years of human history. All of those people before us were always tricked. What's to make you think that you're, you're not being? If we're responsible for the world we create, and we're living mostly in a fiat world that we know is extractive, then who do we have to blame? There is no they, right? Governments that we say are stealing our power could only steal our power if we gave it to them through doing that. We have to be, to, uh, to be smarter, to be able to play a different game. So how do you fight that power? You have to intentionally move your time and energy to the system you want to, want to th thrive. And it doesn't have to be the entire world doing it. It has to be a vigilant number of people that are building, that are providing hope. So, so imagine being stuck in fear and then, and then changing to hope, <laughs> truth, abundance. We've never lived in a world where 8 billion people were in service of 8 billion people and prices fell forever. And it would be really hard if you didn't have the, the mental lattice for what that world would look like and who would if you'd never seen it before and no history book ever showed it before who would have that mental lattice it would really be hard to describe that to people who aren't don't feel like they're experiencing it from the other system the light bulb goes on is and once you're measuring from that system and you are if bitcoin stayed decentralized and secure what i'm talking about is inevitable no matter what it doesn't matter if the existing system prints um, $2 trillion, $8 trillion, $50 trillion. It's just different pieces of paper. And Bitcoin measured against a piece of paper will look like it's going up. But all prices relative to Bitcoin are actually going down and will forever. <music>and salutations my fellow plebs my name is walker and this is the bitcoin podcast the bitcoin time chain is 856948 and the value of one bitcoin is still one bitcoin today's episode is bitcoin talk where i talk with my guest about bitcoin and whatever else comes up and today it is my pleasure to welcome back onto the bitcoin podcast none other than Jeff Booth. Jeff was one of my first interviews on this show, and he is generally one of my favorite people in the Bitcoin space. He always provides an incredible amount of perspective, optimism, and signal, and he does just that today. We dig into a lot in this episode, so I'll keep this intro short and sweet, and just remind you to go to fetty.xyz and set up your own federation. Before we dive in, do me a favor and subscribe to The Bitcoin Podcast, wherever you're listening or watching, and check out my sponsor Bitbox in the show notes, or go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker to get yourself 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. You can also grab links in the show notes to get 5G cell service and protect yourself from SIM swap attacks using Afani and Cloaked Wireless. I am a one-man show, so when you use my partner links, it genuinely helps me to keep this show running, and I truly appreciate it. If you'd rather watch this show than listen, head to the show notes for links to watch on YouTube, Rumble, and on Noster via Highlighter. But if you're like me and you prefer to just listen to your podcast while you do something else, I highly recommend you check out Fountain.fm. Not only can you send Bitcoin to your favorite podcasters to give value for value, but you can earn Bitcoin just for listening to this and other podcasts. Finally, if you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring the Bitcoin podcast, hit me up on social media or through the website bitcoinpodcast.net. Without further ado, let's get into this Bitcoin talk with Jeff Booth. Jeff Booth, welcome back onto uh, the Bitcoin podcast. It's a pleasure to have you back on here. Awesome to be here. Good to see you, Walker. You know, Jeff, I always love picking your brain uh, because I think you're one of the most reasoned and logical voices that we have in the, uh, if you want to call it a community, but the Bitcoin community. And uh, as we were talking before the show here, sometimes uh, you may be accused of repeating certain messages, you know, marginal cost of production, dropping to, to zero, things like this. But I think it's important to repeat those messages because clearly for the vast majority of the population, even for many Bitcoiners, they haven't internalized a lot of these things. So I think a good place to start for us today is to kind of talk about the current system 
and the system that is to come and why it is so dang difficult for not just, you know, people that are still, quote, you know, in the matrix or who have not adopted a personal Bitcoin standard, but even for Bitcoiners to change that worldview that they have to start looking at this new system, to start measuring with this new measuring stick that we have, which is Bitcoin. Do you want to kind of dive into that yeah. a little bit? And, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's a, it's a big topic. Big, um, yeah. And, and I, I obviously try different ways, but let's, uh, let's, so, so let's kind of put some first principles together and then we'll build on, on those. So we know that the free market, the natural state of a free market is deflation. Right. We know, we know that in a free market prices tend to for, for, follow fall to the marginal cost of production um so so just from those two statements if those are true it's also true that we've never lived in a free mar global free market for any length of time um as a derivative we've always lived in a control system and that and that control system that was through broken money kept on getting worse and worse till a time where it would convince people to go to war first split the country as split the country then convince people to go to war to reset currency to then start again 5000 years of human history prove to us that that we've never had a truly global free market for any length of time and another first principle is free markets are far more productive because there's 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 more shots on net capital that, that um, and and so 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 when the U.S. the entire constitution and bill everything around the U.S. was around creating a free market to get out of the trap of uh, Britain, right, and to give individual rights and freedoms to people, and the and the constitution was a document to protect those rights which created one of the a superpower out of those out of those rights because it was more productive people moved from all over the world to the US to take advantage of that more productive and then it too got captured over to over time and the capture over time because it happens so slowly people don't notice it it's, it's happening it happening so so the bill or sorry constitution or magna carta before that any time you introduced free right individual rights and freedoms economy was more productive and it created a trend to people moving there to take advantage of that and you saw more opportunities and and we are a part of that so so you could see individual times throughout history that it was more free or more free in a certain market and the abundance that was created out of that. And then over time, that abundance would get captured by the state and it would trend towards something else, um, uh, more, more controlled. And then it would be, uh, and then it would trend towards capitulating on itself and going to war to try to reset the cur reset the currencies. And then you'd promise not to do it again and it would start again, right? <laughs> so that's an entire history. Um, through the monetary lens of us and, and saying if really in 5,000 years of human history, we've never had a globally free market for any length of time. Um, and so that's a fact, right? And so out of that fact or out of that first principle, then we have always, we always must have lived in a control system and that control system would have to capture our attention more and more of it, capture more of more of our individual rights and freedoms to be able to gain control over us and convince us that it was okay to go to war and create so in the name of freedom, right? To, to, so, so if you look at those two patterns, those are, those are both true. Uh, both true. Both statements are true. We've never seen it. No history book has ever seen it. No economic system has ever seen it. No political system has never seen it. And then we have a new um, protocol bounded by energy, open, decentralized, and secure protocol bounded by energy, Bitcoin, which imposes the free market, which... Uh, which which for the first time in history, you couldn't cheat the cheat that. So it imposes all prices relative to Bitcoin falling forever. 
to the marginal cost of production. And every new person that's moving their time into that system is adding their intelligence, ideas, acceleration to the free market, which is prices in Bitcoin will trend, tend towards the marginal cost of production or prices forever will fall against Bitcoin. That's what it would look like. And I say, if it stays decentralized and secure. So now if these things, if those things are true, we've never had it. Um, then, then it's also true that we've always measured a system by the system and we're inside that system measuring the system. And it's also true that we couldn't measure Bitcoin because there, uh, because there's nothing to measure it against yet, <laughs> or there's, you can measure other things against it, prices falling, and you'd see all prices fall, energy prices fall, house prices fall, all prices fall, according to Bitcoin, which you would expect to happen. Um, but now go back to uh, if, if in 5,000 years we've never had a currency that's, uh, that has resisted that manipulation, um, then we must be one of the, one of the things, all of us, must be part of the equation that allows the centralization. We must be. Because there are lots of smart people in 5,000 years of human history that knew the same things we're talking about now. And all currencies have always been centralized. That's kind of a... I think that's a bit of a... a I would hope eye-opening moment for a lot of people realizing that despite the best efforts of people far more brilliant than, than us throughout history, and there have been a, a lot of them, that still the status quo did not meaningfully change. Yeah. There, there wasn't really a departure from that status quo. It may have looked a little bit different. It may have you know, had a, a, a different color paint on it, but it was ultimately still the same thing. Yeah. And we didn't get away from it. And so, so if that's true, and it is true, right? We know it's true. Then, then you'd have to have a really high bar on the attacks that were going to come to Bitcoin, like a staggeringly high bar on what would, what, what it would, why it would likely be centralized and what would happen to be able to centralize it because, because most people fall into the trap throughout history of of pricing in whatever currency they're in and allowing that centralization, essentially making trade-offs, short-term trade-offs versus long-term. And if it's ne if we've never gotten out of it before, how, what, what's to make, what's to think that, that we would this time. So that's the high, that's the high bar that I think of Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin layer one being, uh, be de being decentralized and secure for, for, um, uh, for now, 15 years and getting more, uh, more secure, more decentralized. I'm not saying that there aren't still some risks uh, there. I'm not saying mining pools and, and, but, but what I can see, what I can see is I think enough people understand what this means for humanity and, and what they're doing is constantly looking for vigilantly <laughs> looking for risks and, and rectify and, and being becoming that's kind of in Bitcoin maxi terms. <laughs> that's what you're doing, right? You're vigilant for attack vectors and you're constantly looking for attack vectors because once you know, once you're out of this crazy matrix and you know, you also know what, uh, what the high importance of decentralized security for hu humankind going forward, you know, you know why that's such an important concept. So, so I think that Bitcoin layer one, uh, I see very little risk in, in layer one because of what I just said. Um, but probably two, three years ago, I said, okay, if I knew, if I knew everything I know, and there's lots of smart people around, they must know everything too. And, and, and you lost layer one. You couldn't, you couldn't, uh, choke off layer one. You couldn't stop it. it. Kept on going. How would you stop Bitcoin at layer two, and then use layer two to to attack layer one? And I think we're really early in the path of that that actually happening. 
Um, and why would that happen if you just tie the 5,000 years? Because most people are pricing in U.S. dollars. They're pricing Bitcoin in U.S. dollars. They're pricing all their assets in U.S. dollars. And that, and, and, and these, these two systems are incongruent together. One is the free market, prices fall forever. One is prices rise forever. They're completely incompatible. And when somebody says they're compatible, they're not. They're only compatible if you subsume the base layer and you can fractionalize it to make prices go up. That makes sense? I, I think it does. And, you know, because I want to get into uh, very much so the kind of the risks associated with layer two on Bitcoin or, you know, and beyond layer two, but everything that's not layer one. I want to dive into that because I think that's... Uh, that's a really important thing for people to understand, to understand both the risks, but also the massive opportunity that we have because there's a lot of incredible technology being built right now. Mm -hmm. But maybe it would be helpful too, just for for folks, let's say they, they have uh, somehow uh, have not heard you speak before, have not, uh, have not listened or read your book, uh, do not understand what is so broken with this current system. Because I think that it's, it's difficult for people, especially in, let's say, the, the so-called Western or developed world to sometimes understand why the heck these psychopathic Bitcoiners seem to care so much about this magic Internet money and why they think things are so bad. Because, you know, my house is getting uh, is, is gro growing in value, quote, uh, it's it's, you know, it, because we have a broken measuring stick. But, you know, my stocks are up things are, things are okay. Why? Yeah. There's some people in other parts of the world struggling, but you know, really, I, I don't see anything too bad. Can you, can you talk a little bit just before we get in the other layers of Bitcoin and what's, what's happening there? Just this idea that I think it's very difficult to understand is the idea of deflation that you, something you've talked about in your book, the price of tomorrow, which was a light bulb moment for me and many other Bitcoiners, I think is that technology is naturally deflationary. Everything should be getting cheaper, but it's not. And somehow we've been conditioned to expect that actually the natural state is that everything just gets a little bit more expensive every year by, quote, 2% or whatever the CPI is. Or, you know, could you talk a little bit about maybe why people are so willing to accept that as the norm? Is it just because we've been conditioned for so yeah. long? I mean, so is, that, is that just purely your, what it is? Your mental model um, and most people's mental model of how the world works is based on the flawed assumption that prices go up and, and they don't have the, you could say you don't have the, 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 um, architecture in your brain to, to even, until you hear it multiple times to hang this idea off of that prices should fall. So you can hear, you can hear the words, the free market is deflationary. And then you could go right back to the world you live in. And you go, and, and then you could be, and then you might not be able to see that the world that you're living in prices going up has to be based on theft then that, and, and you might not see you, you can't connect the dots because it's so hard until you realize the de depth of what I said when, when I said the free market is deflationary, the natural state of the free market. And, and why is that? So it's really easy. You only use things that give you more value. And every entrepreneur globally is competing to try to give you more value. And not just every entrepreneur, every person who is working for an entrepreneur, every team is trying to compete to give you more value on a global competitive level. So the only reason that couldn't reach you in giving you more value is something stopping it from giving you more value. And what's stopping it from giving you more value is massive monetary printing to extract that wealth that should flow you to, to you in the form of lower prices. And by the way, let's just stay on that for a second. So if that's true, and then you, uh, Walker, you start a business tomorrow. And if you don't automate your business and remove labor with AI and machines, then no one uses your business and your business fails. And so, so you're, you're forced to, you have to be more competitive. It's ruthless to be more competitive. And then the output of that is people win because prices fall. If we lived in that world, then, then today, and you can't know this exact number because it's unknowable from the existing system, 
But I would project that the natural rate of deflation in the market today is about 5%. So every year, you would get richer by 5%, even if you did nothing. But the next year, because more people would join that, more competition, the next year would be 7.5%. The next year would be 15%. You get richer by 15% a year or 30% a year as, as technology, AI, automation, robots do more of the work and allow prices to fall faster. And every, every day, every year, you're getting richer. And as 8 billion people move, because today we have a system that we're we're really, you have 500 million winners or really a small fraction of 500 million winners, like eight people with most, with 50% of the wealth of the world. And then you have a, another balance with, which are the one percenters. And then you have the rest of 500 million who are extracting from seven and a half billion people. And those seven and a half billion people, they cannot think like we're thinking right now to be able to contribute to a world that's getting better and better. They're stuck as slaves in an operating system, scared to death. Of how do I make enough money to pay my bill, which perpetuates the slavery further and further and further, and they're getting further and further away. And they're wondering, how do I keep up? So you're, they're so driven away from a productive society. They're, um, they're, they're, they're stuck in that loop. And so I have massive empathy for why many of those people can't see what I'm talking about because they're so far away from, from what, what's ha happening. It would be easy to believe somebody else can solve their problem. Um, it so, so you have to look at what both systems are doing. And, and so what we just, what we just described is we've never lived in a world where 8 billion people were in service of 8 billion people and prices fell forever. And it would be really hard if you didn't have the, the mental lattice for what that world would look like and who would, if you'd never seen it before and no history book ever so, showed it before, who would have that mental lattice? It would really be hard to describe that to people who aren't, don't feel like they're experiencing it from the other system. And, and so that's why, that's why I, even in my book that you could read it today. People, one of the things that makes me probably most proud about that book is people read it over and over and over again, and then the light bulb goes on. <laughs> the light bulb goes on is, and once you're measuring from that system, and you are, if Bitcoin stayed decentralized and secure, what I'm talking about is inevitable, no matter what. It doesn't matter if the existing system prints um, two trillion dollars, eight trillion dollars, fifty trillion dollars. It's just different pieces of paper. And, and Bitcoin measured against a piece of paper will look like it's going up. But all prices relative to Bitcoin are actually going down and will forever. Including the price of fiat money, which is, I think, yeah, again, exactly. it's why people I fail to flip it. Money create, right, be, um, and, or marginal cost of production. What's the marginal cost of production of a fiat unit? Zero. It's worth zero. It's a piece of paper. It's, it's just a piece of paper describing what you believe as, and you're valuing and most people are pricing the world from something that has no value over time. It's going to zero against Bitcoin anyways. I think that this is such an important point. And what you mentioned about, you know, the, the vast, the overwhelming majority of the world not having the architecture yet to be able to understand this. And, and then you can empathize and sympathize with those people to realize, ah, well, this is why they are always looking for political solutions to problems. Always assuming that, well, if we just get the right person in office next time, they've promised that they're going to do X, Y, Z. But ultimately, their promise is, uh, what's underlying the promise is the same guarantee, which is that the money supply will be expanded. And that expansion of the money supply is a blunt instrument. It's so important to, to re like put an exclamation point on what you just said, right? Voting for somebody within the existing system. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote to, and, and somebody that might say Bitcoin um, versus somebody who's going to try to make it harder is probably more, more worth your, your vote, but all votes within the existing system are, are really a vote to who gets more of the theft that comes from you. It's just theater. It's complete theater. 
and all of the theft. And, but, but now let's go back to 5,000 years of human history. All of those people before us were always tricked. What's to make you think that you're, you're not being right. And, and so you have, you, like, you have to be really critical thinking in what's happening in, in what's happening here. If this, if this change, um, and when I looked at Bitcoin specifically, and when I tried to kill Bitcoin specifically, and I, when I, when I tried to attack it, I, all of these lenses for how it would be attacked, I, I, I've thought through at deep, deep, deep level, because, because what, what, what's kind of the 5,000 years of human history. And even today you look around at people predicting the future. Most people don't predict the future. They predict the present forward. They can't, and, and, and then they get on TV again. They make, keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. And they say the same thing and they, they make a new, new prediction and they're still on TV and people follow them all. <laughs> it's crazy. Like if, if you, um, if you look at it, it's almost like a, uh, inverse, um, bias. If you're more wrong, more often you get no, you, uh, you get, if you're, yeah, but but really strong in your beliefs and being wrong, you're constantly in, in the media. It's hard to predict the future and what it has in store for you. But if you want some certainty that you'll be able to actually access your Bitcoin in the future, you need to go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker for 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. Then get your Bitcoin off the exchange, like right now, and into your own self-custody. You may have seen people talking about the Dark Skippy attack, which is a way for a malicious signing device to leak your private keys, which is kind of scary. But luckily, Bitbox is one of the only two wallets to actually address this vulnerability, so you are in luck. Plus, the Bitbox O2 is easy as hell to use. Whether you're brand new to Bitcoin and it's your very first hardware wallet, or you are a well-seasoned psychopath, it is Bitcoin only. And again, it is fully open source. You can head to their GitHub and you can verify all of that for yourself. There's no need to trust me or to trust Bitbox. Plus, when you go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker, not only do you get 5% off, but you also help support this fucking podcast. So thank you. We'll call it the Peter Schiff paradox, maybe. <laughs> uh, some, something like that. No, I, I, I think that's a... It's a really important point. I mean, it's like it goes back. Was it Einstein who said, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? Yeah. That's essentially what we have when you're operating within the current system, when you're still trying to affect change. You know, I, I think I, I believe it was you and it may have been in our last talk where you said, you know, you can't change a system from within the system. Yeah. You, you know, you and, and, it, and you can't, can't measure it either. You can't measure it either. And then you have to come to the terms that that what I said before about the 5,000 years, all of that for, was from within the system, thinking that there's a change from within the system and they, con and they constantly get captured in the same thing. So what makes us any smarter this time? We have to be, to, uh, to be smarter, to be able to play a different game. We have to think at that abstract level, uh, 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 what is the game that's being played and what, and how would it be concentrated? And what would that look like over time if most people are unlike unlikely to see it? we have to assume most people are unlikely to see it because, because that's been our human history. So I think that's actually a, a good jumping off point. Cause you, you, you use this phrase a lot, this caveat, uh, you know, as long as Bitcoin stays decentralized and secure uh, before. And I think it's an important caveat to make, uh, and folks who have listened to you before will probably be familiar with this caveat. Maybe this is a good place to kind of explain a little bit, what what you like genuinely mean by that what is that actual threat vector and then you mentioned earlier saying that at the layer one that threat has been fairly minimized and the longer bitcoin continues to exist the i would assume the more that threat is minimized correct me if i'm wrong but then where does that threat start to materialize does it materialize at these other layers that are going to be necessary for more and more people for bitcoin to scale because we know it scales only at a limited amount on that base layer. And that's part of what keeps it decentralized and secure. Yeah. Yeah, the design elements of Bitcoin, and you know this really well, the, the design space of this to, 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 to create decentralized and security um, 
it's such a unique, it's a once in a lifetime discovery that I don't think can be discovered again once you've, uh, once you've discovered it. And now, now the way that Satoshi did that through proof of work and through kind of honest and mining himself and creating more and more and, and how it emerged and it was unseen by the governments till too late to be able to really start to, to be able to really stop it. It provided an opportunity for that to achieve escape velocity. And, and well, in, at the highest level, why do I believe it'll stay decentralized and secure? Because there's too many people today that know its importance to stay decentralized and secure. You being one of them, Gigi being one of them, Linold and Preston Pish, like name all of the people, like <laughs> Matt O'Dell, name all of these incredible minds uh, that, and, and, um, and I'm not like, I could just list <laughs> names for that know <laughs> this. And, and then all of the entrepreneurs that are, that are different ways to make sure and constantly vigilant against the attacks, right? So ocean protocol and mining, right? There are ocean and uh, in, 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 uh, in, in mining, trying to create something else just in case, right? <laughs> That, uh, that that mining pools get co- uh, co-opted. So lots of different different people constantly watching this and the attack vectors that uh, that could could look. Like. But but something I thought about years ago um, is is if Bitcoin wasn't a medium of exchange, it would fail as a store of value. And and not not. Um, might fail as a store of value, would fail as a store of value, right? Um, gold has failed as a store of value largely. Why? Because it's not a medium of exchange. And by, and by controlling the rails on top of the medium of exchange, uh, on top of the store of value, you can obfuscate, because most people don't count the gold. Um, they're constantly, they're operating in a different level, layer. And then every time that, the gold gets sent, then the gold gets centralized, right? And no matter what throughout history, it always gets reset or taken from you and, re, and, and reset throughout history. So we know it's failed as a store of value. And why is it failed as a store of value? It's failed as a store of value because it couldn't be a medium of exchange. It wasn't native to, to that. So what would you expect to happen if, it, if you knew this and you also knew there are people that know everything we do about Bitcoin and like, and think about kind of the deep state or, or, and the, these giant pockets of money that's coming from stealing from you with, how are we going to stop this? You would have to stop it at a layer two. You would have to, you would have to say Bitcoin is a store of value. And you would have to, and you would have to say, we're going to move the U.S. dollar on top of on top of it, and then fractionalize it, and then at some point, because people wouldn't see the risk in it, and Bitcoin measured in U.S. dollars would keep going up in value, as more people raced in, and all of the people making their assumption in U.S. dollars would be cheering that. Right? Yes, more and more people dri- driving this, and then. And then they would they would dismiss the risk of holding self custody. They would go into the ETFs. More people would do that. They would they would you would build an entire derivatives instrument machine on top of fract- uh, financialization of Bitcoin on top of that, which would further move it away from self custody and move and and then then layer one would be attacked a long time later through that through that centralizing function. And, and why, and why, and this is why that if you go and go back to the 5,000 years, because we're, we're so used to pricing things in the U S dollar and we think prices go up. So it would be perfectly natural to measure Bitcoin going up in U S dollars, which, which most people would fall into the trap of it'd be, it would be unnatural to price things in Bitcoin going down. This idea that, uh, you know, people say, you know, Bitcoin, NGU, you know, number go up is that, is that the, a very powerful meme, but it's ultimately number go down. It's deflation. 
versus fiat, which is inherently number go up technology. It's it's inflation. Yeah. So that's a, and, and so if you measure now, if these systems are incompatible together, and you're measuring this the incompatibly through the U.S. dollar, what you're actually saying is I'm trading Bitcoin for a U.S. dollar, or I'm thinking in that trade, and you're making the U.S. dollar strong, or you're you're allowing this attack vector to to become more pre prevalent because, because of those actions. So Bitcoin has to be used as a, as a medium of exchange to, for it to, to achieve. Now remember, there's two different versions of a world, many different versions of the world. I'm talking about the one that I see, the one that I see in Bitcoin, 8 billion people in service of 8 billion people and, and all of the productive capacity not misaligned capital, not bullshit, not, not made up money that influences some that monopolies that extract value, not an extractive system. I am talking about 8 billion people in service of 8 billion people um, that we can't even see today. For that to happen, Bitcoin needs to be used as a medium of exchange and it needs to be native inside not other tokens and other things that will be captured it needs to be uh and and now if you pull on that thread we know bitcoin on layer one can't be used by eight billion people so uh and and i want to just say something quickly on that um it's i the irony in talking to people who say it's there's no utility in bitcoin when the utility is the entire global wealth of of a system change. <laughs> it's it, it's it's staggering. Like, there's never been a bigger utility by having decentralized it and secure. You remove money from the state, and you allow the free market to work. There is no bigger. There has never been a bigger utility, and um, and and so and then what comes on top of that as a protocol. You're, you're early in a cycle of coming up, uh, 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 building on top of that that turns it into a money that's native to the protocol. And uh, yet on the utility point, it, I, that's always one of the biggest uh, giveaways that somebody has really not thought very hard about this at all. It's just like, okay, like the biggest red flag you could possibly say, you know, Bitcoin has no utility. It's, it's just like, ah, I almost I almost pity, pity those who say that because you, you just, you truly you don't understand the change that's happening. And more fundamentally, I don't think you even understand money like, at, at all. But that's, you know, again, we're many of us, we all are, I guess, products of the system that has been indoctrinating us for 5,000 years. And you and, and I were both, <laughs> and we have to remember any one of us as Bitcoiners too, we were once those yes. people who didn't understand this. Um, yes. And, uh, and so we've all, you just, it's a journey to be able to get there. And that journey goes deeper and deeper and, and something that's this deep that touches all of humanity, obviously touches everything else. It has to, it's the center of like it, it, money is global trade and all businesses and all political systems. And it's a center for everything we do. We trade with each other to try to get more value around the world. Um, so, so obviously something that impacts that has to impact everything we do. And, and this change to this change in an operating system from one that, that was extractive from us to one that, that was cooperative, that was gave back to us would be really difficult to see, especially if you're measuring from the system. I'm just, uh, what I guess what I'm arguing is, is everyone measuring us dollar, uh, Bitcoin in price of us dollar or whatever current or whatever piece of paper they want to measure Bitcoin by they're reinforcing the trade. And I think that's, uh, a really important point for folks to grok because we now see, you know, in the United States, as an example, this idea of the Bitcoin strategic reserve being thrown out there. Uh, you know, we we see now politicians, uh, which was inevitable, but starting to realize, ah, I can't just ignore this Internet corner of magic Internet money weirdos any longer. Turns out their purchasing power is growing exponentially. Uh, turns out their cultural power is also growing. Their economic power is growing their political power is growing. I need to pay attention to this. And now you're seeing a lot of this, uh, I'll call it pandering because I think innately that's what politicians need to do. You know, talk is cheap. So you may as well, 
you know, say whatever is going to get you elected. Uh, but we see now this this idea of this Bitcoin strategic reserve type thing being floated. And you also see it seems there's been a bit of a shift of late that I've sensed where there seems to be much more political acceptance of uh, private stable coins. And to me, it seems almost it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, and it seems that in many ways, if if a private stable coin, OK, it's not issued by the state, but it's uh, it's a U.S. dollar instrument and it is surveilled, controlled and so basically uh, it's supporting the current fiat standard. Is that just a, a, a CBDC by another name that's not yes. as explicitly issued by the central bank, but is yes. a de facto CBDC? Yes, that's actually why this whole thing turns into an Orwellian control system way faster than people realize that are that are pricing in a U.S. dollar, because because see, and again, this is going way back, but but all of the things that are being played out today, um, you could easily predict if you, um, I called you a couple of weeks ago kind of talking about this and, and but you could easily predict all of the things that are playing out if you had to control layer two like what would you do you would make it you would make it a store of value you would accept it you would make etfs okay you would you would make a whole bunch of um things okay uh, okay there and and then you would and you would need tether or stable coins to purchase your debt and as Bitcoin grew, you would have this natural buyer of more and more treasuries so that people could interact in there. So it would fund that <laughs> and it would fund the capture of this, uh, of this as well. If most people use that, because what is it? What is a stable coin? What it, it, it's something that's guaranteed if Bitcoin stays decentralized and secure to lose, uh, lose value against Bitcoin at the same rate as the US dollar. It's guaranteed to. So why would you use that, right? It's a, you have a guaranteed loss against Bitcoin. But if you, if you think, if you're trading the stability, which most people will do <laughs> around the world, because they think US dollar is so much better than their currency, so they'll naturally do it. And you'll have all of these people around the world believing that, yes, I finally can use this other thing that is also funding the centralization of everything we're talking about. And it's a, to, it's a total net. So, so what we're talking about will happen, not might happen, will happen natu uh, naturally. So if you, if you realize that all of these things would happen for sure, and you realize that for Bitcoin to be a, um, a, um, used as a medium of exchange natively, not on, not on a stable coin or, or some, some other instrument, a VC instrument and the rent, some other <laughs> token, then, then you had to, you had to build the same type of, um, safety in the layer two and layer three that exists in, or d in different types of extending the capability of Bitcoin, um, out into different layers to allow it to be used as a, as a transaction medium, a medium of exchange around the world. And you had to, uh, and you had to know that these, that the momentum from history and the momentum from most people in the world would be moving the other way because they would want Bitcoin to go up in price relative to us dollars. So they would just be feeding the exact same narrative that would make the centralization of it happen. And I think that's kind of a, a perfect transition to talk a little bit about these other layers, because again, uh, depending on how deep you've gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you may fully understand the, the, the power of Bitcoin as a, you know, layer one base money. Uh, you may not have gone deep enough down the rabbit hole to see all of the incredible development that is happening on top of layer one on layer two and so on. And some of that development, I know you are particularly tuned into this through ego death you guys are investing in companies that are doing this that are trying to build these solutions one of those companies is fetty which is building federated e-cash on top of lightning on top of bitcoin and they just launched officially globally you can go to fetty.xyz you can download this from the app store you can play with this this is a really powerful thing that i want to i want to dig into deeply with you because 
Fetty also went open source. That was part of the announcement that Fetty was going open source. And that is a really powerful thing. It's also somewhat a, a non-standard thing to do when you've spent years building out this technology stack, spending all this time and money building a product and then deciding, you know what, we're going to completely open source this and make it available to anyone who wants to use it. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Why Fetty is so important as we are in this period where you, you have correctly identified that there is centralization risks happening. And I would say perpetuation, fiat perpetuation risks happening because we are still, so many of us are still operating within this fiat system yeah. and perhaps unintentionally perpetuating it by our actions. So why, yeah. why is Fetty so important and why is it so important right now? Yeah. And that, it's not just Fetty. Yeah. Um, but so, so, uh, eCash, Fetty, um, like, uh, all of developers in lightning, especially self-custodial lightning that's creating the, um, uh, uh, all of these things, Noster, all of the developers and people working on these, all of the projects won't be successful, but the explosion of opportunities and the, and the, and what's happening at the protocol level is these things are interoperable with each other which makes other things more successful in time and ex it, it increases the acceleration of what's happening in a, in the line of human freedom, abundant hope, human hope and abundance. So it, all of this, and we're really early in that influ uh, uh, in that all coming together. And Fetty is one of the pieces that helps that come together. So how I would look at, Lightning first, or lightning and liquid. Let's bu bucket lightning liquid in the same in the same bucket. Um, and I would look at that as and potentially arc if if when arc uh, comes out in any any sort of way that doesn't require a uh, soft fork. Um, I would look at those as an interoperability layer, like a highway system. Um, and so if if Bitcoin couldn't be used by eight billion people, you needed an interoperability uh, highway system that connected to people's cities. And so, so Bitcoin prices, more and more people use it. The fees will go up on Bitcoin layer, uh, layer one. And, and those fees going up makes it not being able to use for cu cups of coffee because the fees are too high. Right. So, so, so then lightning fills that void and it attack and allows it to move to maybe maybe with further work on billions, right? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe hundreds, millions, maybe billions, but allows it to be a super highway network. The way the lightning was first, uh, seen though, I think many people thought each lightning node, each Bitcoiner had to run their own lightning node, right? And by doing so, then you had liquidity problems inside those nodes. And it would be, look, it would be a, a, an analogy I often use is, Instead of building a super highway network, you would build all backlane one way roads, right? And you can imagine the traffic accidents and what that would look like and the congestion <laughs> if your super highway looked like that. And so, so if you saw lightning liquid that works as that, that intercompatibility, uh, uh, layer, then you'd see Fetty as the Fetty's or Fetty, uh, Fediment or Cashew as the, um, as the cities where you could, uh, um, where you could extend that for no, almost no fees, right? So fees would be higher on baseline right? and then they would move higher on lightning and then it would push up to almost negligible or negligible fees in, in Fediment or, or, or cashew where you have complete privacy of transaction, complete cr privacy of communications inside a network that uh, that that is uh that so you're completely immune <laughs> from what's happening in the exact uh, rest of the world and now um and l let's imagine you were in north korea and you had no money and somebody who was in 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 the guardians of fetty wanted to set up guardians outside of north korea and those guardians couldn't be found then you would have money constantly no communication could be hacked. It'd be completely private. You'd have money that would just be circular money that people could send you all day long. 
um, and no one can stop that or know that it's, it, it's even happening. And if you wanted to delete your phone, it off your phone and then put it back on, all of your money would be there still. So, so you ha to be able to, to do that, to be able to create that kind of third rail or third layer, um, you could call it as two, a second and a half layer or whatever, then, then the way, what are the trade-offs uh, of that? The trade-offs with Fetty specifically um, are um, the guardians that would, it works like multi-sig. So the guardians at the bottom of the multi-sig, people would run software on different computers and they would be the guard. They would set up the rules for the interoperability of, of eCash on top of Bitcoin. And so the rules may be one Bitcoin in, one Bitcoin out. Um, and those guardians would set up all the trans. And the guardians couldn't see any of the transactions on top. They couldn't see anything that's happening on top, or any of the, or any of the um, communications. But they would set up the rules by that which that federation runs by. Um, so what is the risk to that? The risk is what if the guardians conspired against you, and fractionalized your Bitcoin, and you didn't know. So how would you solve that risk if you were Fetty? And what Fetty's going to do is, is essentially, and what I think is going to happen naturally in the free market is tons of these are going to get set up. And, and then what you'll do is you'll create a bank run on, on your federation to make sure they're fully reserved. Um, and you could do that bank run by pressing like it, that fast and move all your money from one to another. And so you might be in five different federations and constantly create different bank runs to make sure that they're fully reserved. But what it, so that that seems like a pretty good trade off of risk to be able to put all the control in your hands to be able to allow you to operate safely privately in a world that's becoming more centralized and more controlled, and all communication channels are are being monitored, you need something outside of that. You need something that's, that's outside of that, that, that creates circular economies that cannot be infiltrated. I think that this is such a, a powerful, powerful piece of technology because, and you had a, you had a really great uh, quote. I think you posted it on, uh, on Nostra. I'll, I'll, I'll read it just because I've, I've read it a few times and I think it's just, it's quite spot on. And you said, in a world where dictators use money and data as a weapon against free speech and individual rights and freedoms, and the surveillance state is emerging everywhere, this freedom and privacy protocol on top of Bitcoin is a critical path to bringing Bitcoin to billions of people. And I think that's incredibly succinctly put. And people tend to think, you know, there's the old trope, you know, why do you need privacy if you have nothing to hide? And for anyone who wants to take like a real deep dive in Fetty, uh, into Fetty, I, I did a conversation with Obi. The CEO, you can you can go and listen to that. I did another one with uh, with Cali on uh, Cashew and eCash. If you want to dive deep into that, and these are really these are incredible protocols. The idea of near perfect privacy, right? Like truly, nobody can see, and it's a it's a black box of sorts, and that is incredibly powerful. But I have to also wonder, many governments around the world are not going to like that. They, because it's not just a black box for your money. That's actually a black box for your communication, too. Your communications within your federation are equally private. It's, 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 you know, it's data going through that federation. So, I mean, how do you look at those risks, risks and is that why it's so important that we you know, bring awareness to this technology now that this is out there just to try and scale it up as much as possible? I've been on a weekly call with, the, with Obi for the last two and a half years. Uh, on on what would come, what would the risk be, what would happen, and how do we build this in a way that is in line with the principles of Bitcoin, in 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 line with the ability, the human freedom, abundance, the the vision that I that 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 I talk about. Um, how do you not get captured if this is this powerful technology? How do you, and what do you have to do to be? And so why this has been built in an enterprise grade way, and why we delayed launch. Um, is to be able to create it in, in that way. So, um, and, and recently, you, know, you probably saw it on Noster, there was, and something we hadn't even expected, some of the guardians that, fill, uh, that set up their first federations actually mentioned Fetty in the website that they would have filled out the DNS, right? 
and and that would be like nobody looks for like it's shutting down a DNS at the DNS level is like deep state operation. So so a couple of the guardians were turned off because the DNS was shut off of the of those, which means which mean it, 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 uh, by the way it, it, that's that's awfully flattering to have such a young company <laughs> <laughs> um, that 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 is so important to try to stop uh, uh, to uh, to try to stop but, um, but and so that's that's resolved that's the, you can move DNS eventually you're going to be able to tie it into Noster so this is built in a way that's completely anti-fragile so you could today now if you had technical chops you could go and set up your own federation today um, with five of your friends um, and it, you could run a family federation you could run um, you could set up tons of these federations for different uh, different uh, uh, different pe uh, people and that can happen right now and it's so hard to find the guardians, just like it's so hard to find the nodes in Bitcoin. And that's what keeps it. So th by having more of these federations and having more nodes and everything else, it almost becomes, un it, it, not almost, it becomes unstoppable. So then where is the risk? That's why Fetty uh, went open source, is because the risk is in the company or the people that are doing it. And you had to put in, and, and what they, uh, what they did is put, um, put, if Fetty ever get stops as a company, this code is immediately open source, completely open source. So that, so that, that it created a, a, a way to, to negotiate <laughs> with doing the right thing in a way that couldn't be stopped. Like a dead man switch of exactly sorts. Dead man switch of sorts. I, I think that that's really important because, again, depending on where you live in the world, depending on how much you pay attention, depending on how much you use various uh, social media platforms or protocols, you may have a varying opinion of what you believe the current state of the censorship industrial complex is. If you live in an authoritarian country, where you know, if you live in in North Korea, well, you. My God, it's it's so intense that you don't even have to worry about it because you know you can't even uh, you know get internet. Uh, so, but if you live in you know a place like China, uh, you have a different level of that, right? You have a different level of surveillance. You have the Great Firewall, which you know protects you from so many dangerous things that might be out there on the the old World Wide Web. If you live in America right now, if you live in Canada, uh, if you live in you know, well, Europe is. Uh, Getting to be an interesting case, which with how they're treating various forms of speech as uh, very jailable offenses, but the again the you know so-called developed world, uh, the Western world, still enjoys at least a modicum of free expression, free speech. You know, America, I would say very much so. As through all its faults, it is still somewhat of a bastion of free speech. Uh, now we've also seen you peek behind the curtain, you see th some things like the happened when the Twitter files, you see that there are a lot, there's a lot more censorship going on. There's a lot more suppression of information than most people realize. And so much of that censorship also inevitably gets tied back to censoring you from the financial system as well, because money is that ultimate. It's the, you need freedom of uh, freedom to use money. If you want to have the freedom to exercise your speech, right? This seems like a great workaround for that. And again, you correctly mentioned there's trade-offs, right? Yeah, it's not base chain Bitcoin, but it's not trying to be. It's trying to provide something else, right? It's trying to provide that privacy that layer one Bitcoin cannot provide because it's so a you, transparent you, you, you protocol. Know, let's, let's play on this too. And, and yeah. let's tie it into some of the other altcoins. Okay. Um, and most of the altcoins and most of the idea behind, behind some of the altcoins were were really poorly thought out in something. Um, but let's look at some of the ones that still people use today and why they would uh, use them in Monero or something that would be private would be, would, would be an important use case. And a lot of people that would care about that would, would, would probably agree with me that Bitcoin would have been captured at layer two and three because it was a, it's open network and you had to have something outside of the control because as a control structure got worse and worse, 
it would, and everybody centralized against it, of course, everyone centralizing against it would attack it. Right. And so, so they see themselves in the, another coin that couldn't be decentralized and secure and, and might, and, or even if you went Bitcoin cash as example, it was from big blocks and I'm completely against, but if you, if you said, if you steel man the other argument and they said, you have to use it as a currency, otherwise it'll get controlled. You could see some people inside that thinking that has to happen and it does have to have to happen. I think they were just misguided in how it would happen. It would happen after in layers on top of a protocol that was decentralized and secure. So what we're seeing right now in lightning and what we're seeing in Fed, uh, in Fedi is offering the different critical pieces of the infrastructure that are required to keep it decentralized and secure on a base that's decentralized and secure and bounded by energy. And so, um, but, but if you just kind of look back over the history and all the fights, Bitcoin, everything else, you could see some of the thoughts on some of the other things were true, were, were still needed until they weren't when you had something native to Bitcoin that was on top of it, that it could, it could get, it could extend the decentralization of security of Bitcoin into a whole bunch of different, different areas. So that's what's happening now. It's very exciting that that's happening. And again, I want to drive home your your point there, which is that it, it's the idea of trying to build a castle on quicksand or build it on, you know, granite, right? You, If you want to build something that's going to last and not just be a nice little experiment for a few people, it needs to be built on a rock solid foundation. That is why you cannot sacrifice decentralization or security to your to your point at the base layer. Because if you don't have the base layer that is decentralized and secure and is just completely, you know, as close as one can get to unstoppable, then anything else that you're, any other cool little whoopsie doos that you're doing on top of that don't really matter. Dude, that, that's, it's, it's performative, it's right? It's totally. performative. And so we have that base layer now. We have that decentralized and secure base layer. We actually now, have layer two and we now have the, the other layer. These are all, these are all live. These are yeah. all, we have all the technology right now that um, to be able to to explode this in in a medium of exchange in a private secure way in a it's all the technology is there already at a protocol layer. And, and so, actually, I, just a question based on that because that's I think something that people miss when uh, people, let's say, in the larger crypto space that are proposing all these neat little experiments that they have on, on Solana or on Ethereum, all these, you know, various, these cool little things that they show off at their dev conferences. And then that people go on CNBC VC funds to pump their new allocation to Solana or whatever. So much is already built on Bitcoin and Bitcoin layers and is live. And I think that somehow gets lost and maybe it's a good thing that some of it gets lost because some things like, like Fetty, like uh, eCash more, more broadly as well. Those are such powerful pieces of technology. And you do want to make sure they can get off the ground a little bit and get in use so that this, these layers of this protocol become like the Hydra. You know, so if you chop off one head, two more grow in its place and it keeps on expanding. But you see this from a different lens because you are actively uh, an investor in this space. You're you know, one of the good VCs. You guys are funding open source Bitcoin development. Why do you think that there's like, again, is this just a people aren't paying attention or is it that they don't want to pay attention to all it's the things a, that are being it, built? So, like, early, so one of the key pieces is, is protocols don't come along very often. Um, hmm. and they, and they, and they come in layers and people can't see. So people that the, the initial layer only does one narrow thing wants that thing to do everything else. So they try to congest the initial layer with other things. So, so all of the, Bitcoin improvement protocols you could put into that bucket. I need it to do this too, to be able to do my thing. So you, so you, so you, you have that and it, it's resisted. It's resisted all of these. It, it, it needed the 2017 <laughs> fork, right. To be able to resist it, but it's resisted all of these changes to be able, that would have centralized it. Um, and so, so what, but then if people can't do the thing they want to, if they're just getting rich by holding a, a Bitcoin and, and, but they want to, they want to do something, then 
I'm going to create something else, a token that's going to do something else and convince everybody my tokens, the, the Bitcoin. And, and you could easily in a world that's moving from a system that's of total abuse and extraction and these people are getting rich. If you had a new one, you, of course the market would look like that. Right. And then, and most people wouldn't understand the protocol because they never see protocols. They only protocols come around so rarely they would think it's a technology. And it'd be super easy to conflate people thinking technology that this new blockchain is better, but it's a protocol. It's a protocol that's bounded by energy and it doesn't care what you think of it. TikTok next block is bounded by energy. So if you want to print more pieces of paper, if you want to expand your government about against it, it doesn't care. It just keeps on going. And now because that's so strong and so like it, it, it built on bedrock, then other layers are being built on top of it that are u utilizing, extending its decentralization and security out to more and more use cases on top of it without needs for other tokens, without need for somebody else on a control structure on top of it. It's, and so, so how does, if you just specifically say, how does Fetty achieve that? It's actually the same thing that, um, that kind of many people in Bitcoin first saw, or, or, um, around, Hal Finney being one of them, in, in, thinking about e-cash as, as Bitcoin banks, right? And you could go back to the, there'd be, need to be banking on top of this that fully reserved Bitcoin to be able to extend, uh, send this. And if you, and so he put a post on the message board back 14 years ago that, um, about this. So he obviously saw it as a protocol. He saw what you would need to do. And that, and some of this technology that is now emerging is just unified with what's ha what's happening there. And, and so you resolve that, that risk, that risk, or you resolve that paradox of not being able to scale by decentralizing and scaling to putting you in control, like putting you in control, uh, you Walker running your own federation, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't cheat people, right? And, 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 and so you put together five different walkers and say, this is the, this is this federation. People are pretty, pretty, pretty sure you don't cheat them. They might even, if they're your really close friends or your family, you're probably not going to cheat them. <laughs> um, and so you, you secure yourself by either doing it yourself um, or doing it through somebody that you really trust the same way as you do with multi-sig today. This is such an interesting point because I think that when a lot of folks maybe struggle to wrap their heads around Fetty, you know, it's this, it's always, well, what, what if they rug you? What if they rug you? That's all, and, and good. It's a good thing that people are asking that question, right? And you already they previously just, they, they should, should. That question. that's yeah. the first question you should ask, right? And you already discussed, okay, you know, you could have a, you can have sweeps, you could have auto sweeps even where, you know, every whatever X days, I want to auto sweep. I want to, I want to cause a bank run these X days to make sure they're fully reserved. But what I think people are missing a little bit is we've been so indoctrinated with these massive bloated centralized control structures that we assume that that's what it's going to look like with that. These federations are going to be the same thing. They're going to be these massive huge, you know, bloated structures that they can rug so much Bitcoin from people when in reality, this is a return to a more localism type of thinking, a return to true, not decentralization as a buzzword that's used to sell another VC token, true decentralization, localism, communities, families, small organizations, they're but all inter they're all of interoperable with each other. Yeah. You wouldn't even know, right? The, the rails on and off this, I, I use Fetty as my primary wallet now. Um, and the rails on and off this when I'm not inside a federation making payments in a federation to other members in that federation, um, I'm using lightning as a interoperability, that highway network. And I wouldn't know, like it's, it, it, it works so seamless, seam, seamlessly. Um, and, and the, it does exactly what you just said. So now you have thousands and then millions of these, these all millions. And, and that becomes the, the when you said the Hydra, right? Try to, if there were one or two or three of them, they would be stopped. If there's millions of them, just like if there were one or two or three nodes in Bitcoin, it would be stopped. If there's hundreds of thousands or, uh, or 50,000 of them or 10,000 of them or, or millions of them, 
they can't be stopped. And every time you try to stop one, 10 more grow up in its place. Because, why? Because, because the transactions cost almost nothing on them. They're so private. It, it's, it's a, it's a hundred X system change. Uh, uh, it's a hundred X advantage to the system you're in today. And as more and more people start to realize that, and they're going to be forced to realize it because they're inside this thing, this creeping authoritarian socialism state that they don't know is, is actually stealing their power and, and energy more and more are going to move over and it's unstoppable. And I think it's, it's important to point out that it, this isn't just like a hundred X improvement. Just if we just look at like transaction costs, which are essentially like near free, they're infinitesimal within a federation, right? Uh, the privacy and uncensorability within these federations, I think is like, it's hard to even quantify that because that's not something we have at all in the current system. If you're using the U S dollar rails in any digital way, if you're using U S dollars in cash or any fiat currency in cash, yes, you do have some semblance of privacy, right? I can hand you five, uh, five dollars or uh what do you use up there uh, loonies is that what you call them uh yeah yeah you know you, you we can do that in a very private way if nobody's watching nobody knows that that five dollars has changed hands but if you're using digital rails for any fiat system you are being surveilled from start to finish and there there is no semblance of custody there as well not even that there's a trade-off of custody there's no you you, you don't own that the dollars in your bank aren't yours yeah, and then you go to yeah. you, then you go to the bank and ask for a thousand dollars in the cash <laughs> and you have an entire laundry list of questions asking why um yep. if you have to ask those questions it's not your money right it, it's it, it it's it's they're they're lending that it, that money is their money right you shouldn't have to ask those questions on your money the and and so we're gonna re, we're going to return to a world but it's going to be really chaotic <laughs> Because some most people are measuring what's happening through that same do, through that same system that's extracting from them. And and I want to I want to ask you a little bit, uh, just kind of. It's so hard, like, to conceptualize what this starts to look like, right? What, what the I agree, there's going to be a massive period of chaos, which may be very uncomfortable, will be uncomfortable, but. As I mean, when I think of federations, kind of the first thing I thought of was like, oh, this is like an even more decentralized free banking era type of thing, but with actual, ver you know, more uh, verifiability in your in your reserves. Yeah. Right. But it, but it's it's optionality for people ultimately. And optionality means greater freedom. Like that is literally the freedom to choose where you want to deposit your, uh, you know, the scarcest asset humanity has ever discovered and be able to use it in a private and, uh, you know, a really convenient way. But what, what does your vision for the future look like? What, what does this actually, what does the world on not just a sound money standard look like? Because we could have a world that has that, but where there is still complete and perhaps more strengthened U.S. dollar hegemony because we've, we've missed the medium of exchange part yeah. and we've just focused we, on the store we, value. What does it look like in your view? Yeah, that's actually why I'm, it, it, these things are incompatible over the long time together. So in one system, Bitcoin, if it stays decentralized and secure, then all prices fall relative to it. To stay decentralized and secure, it requires being a medium of exchange. These are the, tool, these are the tools, these are the early indication tools or protocols that are going to ensure that it remains decentralized and secure and ensure that it moves into a medium of exchange. Um, without them, it would be highly likely that it, it would be get captured because, um, because, because through the, essentially what all you would do is us dollar to gold, us dollar, to petrodollar system, us dollar to Bitcoin, nothing would have changed. Right. And that, um, and, 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 and I would, I would say the vast majority of even Bitcoiners, um, today, because the Bitcoin, there's such a deep hole, <laughs> um, are still measuring Bitcoin and price in the U S dollar. And so I saw one of the questions that'll help people understand what I'm talking about here. And we'll try to, to, uh, kind of look at it from both systems and the question, but it had something about the financialization, right? Um, something and help them to understand pricing in Bitcoin. And so 
it, over the last 30 years, everything you've ever no known, and most people have made all of their money, not really made money, the, the entire wealth of the world is an artificial construct of extracting from some people, giving it to the other, through an instrument of financialization. And, it, and through that financialization of a uh, lens, then it would look like houses have gone way up in price um, because they, could, they, would be, they would act as a store of value because cash couldn't act as a store of value because it was an inferior store of value. So you'd have to find other stores of value. Those stores of value became houses. Those stores of value became stocks. And you start getting higher and higher bid prices on all of these stores of value that reinforce, instead of a house being a utility where you raise your family, it becomes a store of value. And then everybody races into the store of value because if they're not in the store of value and only in cash, they're getting destroyed. So everybody goes and makes the same trade, pushing it up higher and higher and higher, further away from its utility value as a store of value. And then, and then enter Bitcoin. And enter Bitcoin is repricing all of those to their utility value. And, 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 or the marginal cost of production, everything on the planet. So if you measured both those... This house, I've t said that before, was $1.4 million four years ago. Now it's $2.1 million, Can Canadian pieces of paper. In Bitcoin, <laughs> it was 300 uh, Bitcoin four years ago. Now it's 22 Bitcoin. Um, in four years, this house will be two Bitcoin. Um, and so and er all Bitcoiners are facing the same choice. When do I want to buy this asset? Because uh, a lot of Bitcoiners want to buy the house because they've been so locked out of the housing market because everybody's racing into it, leveraged against it. And so they um, so they can't wait to spend their Bitcoin on a house. And everybody is able to make that choice whenever they want, but it's going to keep happening, right? In 10 years, this house might be 0.1 of a Bitcoin. And, and so if I had a whole bunch of bit, uh, Bitcoin, um, as, the, as Bitcoin is repricing this into the house to its utility value, I can make a choice any time to be able to use my Bitcoin to be able to uh, price, uh, price my house. If I price it today, what I'm really paying for is a way overpriced house be because, because people see it as a store of value. And it's a really bad store of value compared to Bitcoin. Really bad store of value. Now, if you want a house because, you, uh, because of your family and your neighborhood and everything else, you should do that. You should do whatever you want to at your choice. But it, but if you're in the store of value that everyone else is in because it's the only game in town, there is a new game in town. I think that that is a really, it's a difficult, it's a tough pill to swallow. It's going to be for a lot of people. But I think it's a very good one to swallow because that's what your house should be, right? Like it should be where you should be buying it because you say, well, I want to live here with my family. I want to raise my kids here. I want to make memories here. I want, I want this because of the utility that I get out of it. Not years because ago, houses yeah. look different. They look, yeah. they, they look like a neighborhood of, uh, of, of young families, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that was a community. Houses don't look like that anymore because all over the world in other currencies that are debasing just as fast in, uh, or faster, they're trying to get into your, your stores of value too. So yeah. this is how. So you have a global phenomenon bidding up houses far beyond the uh, utility value as a store value, and all of the debt underlying that that is contingent. It's a contingent liability against the entire system. So it has to keep going higher because you're having to debate. Because if that debt became due, if you didn't inflate that debt away, it's over. The whole thing, the whole thing crumbles. And so those assets are are a core part and so are and so is commercial real estate and all of these things are interlocked into inefficient stores of values, really terrible stores of value, but they were the best thing. Uh, but they were the best stores of value for the last 30, 40 years. So everyone rushes into that trade thinking that I have to have a house to protect my wealth. Well, and the sad thing is too, that if you look at like the compound annual growth rate of the money supply, depending on what you look at, like, but even just in the U S you're looking at like high 6%, close to 7% for the CAGR of the yeah. money supply, which is also 
over a longer period about what the housing market increased by. It's about what the S&P increases by. It's about what everything that is supposed to be a benchmark or a good place to store your value increases by. But that means it's not increasing. You're just treading water. Worse. It only captures half the equation. The other half of the equation that's stolen from you nat unnaturally is the actual deflation rate that should be in a house. The actual deflation rate of all the materials and all of the other things that as efficiency... Per like, think about a, what a lumber mill looks like today with what, versus what it looked like 100 years ago. Think about what any mining it looks like. It's all automated, automated, uh, uh, completely uh, almost auto automated. And these things are highly efficient operations that would mean all of the, the different products relative to the uh, house should be far cheaper, not just neutral. So prices should have fallen all in, uh, in all of it. And I think that is perhaps one of the most difficult things for folks to understand, even if they may understand that, ah, okay, inflation is this bad thing and I'm, I'm feeling poorer because my purchasing power is dropping because of inflation they're not actually seeing the extent of the rot that is there. They're not actually seeing the extent of the theft, which is you're not stealing, as you said, you're not stealing from the baseline. You're stealing from, from negative. You're, you're stealing from deflation and then, so right, and then making up for it and then some. Right, right now, if you so, and, and as a result of that, you have to make bad investments, right? So you have to misallocate capital faster. Why government expands? As a result, you have to constantly misallocate capital faster and, const and constantly create next waves of hype to be able to create more misallocation of capital to be able to, to drive this instability in the system to ever increasing, in, which, which is a centralization of a, a function. And most people, even if you said today, people are measuring the CPI and they're cheering um, because CPI is starting to come down or not coming down quite fast enough and then there's going to be lower interest rates so there's more liquidity. They're actually cheering, the market is cheering, you're going to have to debase currencies more. Pump my bags, right? Yeah. You know? it, 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 it's wild. It's wild. It, and and, and, they're, and they're, they're all measuring from zero inflation instead of the an implied productivity rate in an economy, which should be negative. It, it's It's... It is kind of crazy that like, I feel like a lot of people also get to perhaps this nihilistic point where it's like, yeah, screw it, print the money, pump my bags. Like I hold enough assets. They're all, they're all going to just go up like gangbusters. And when you, when you start easing like crazy and ter getting that printer humming again, but, but what a sad state of affairs that that's where we've gotten to where it's like, well, yeah, even for people like a lot of Bitcoiners were like, well, yeah, I know it's theft. Um, I, I know that inflation is, is theft, but, you know, at least that theft is pumping my bags, too. And like, I get it. You know, you're in the system, play the system for what it is. But I just I think it's it's kind of sad at a certain so, point. So it is. A, then you could say the positive side. Um, all of these individual actions in this, when somebody is going to sell their Bitcoin for, for U.S. dollars and then tri make that trade, is just going to create more hardcore Bitcoiners and more people who understand this. If you think about all of the positive in this network and all of the people, even through these conversations, that you get a nuance that's a little deeper, takes you somewhere deeper. And then once you're into that, you can't unsee it. And you start to apply your... So, you said something about the VC ego death capital, and um, um, you said one of the good guys in the, uh, in in this. Well, we started ego death capital because I saw this future. And then, how do you accelerate this future with uh, with the best entrepreneurs? And and I and and I wouldn't have seen what was possible before. I just kind of I needed to put my time into this to um and and help this ecosystem thrive uh and i wouldn't have i wouldn't have seen all of what's happening i wouldn't have wouldn't been able to work with these brilliant minds in creating this unless i did so so i'm so much the richer <laughs> for it i can't believe it um and 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 when you see that and then other people are joining their voices and uh and 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 so that that's accelerating as we start to understand, and once we understand kind of what this looks like at a deeper level, it touches everything else, more people start to understand what it's, and they move their time to it too. So you could be, um, you could get 
sad about the state of what the world looks like, or you could get massively optimistic about what it's going to look like from what everybody's doing. And, and I, I should clarify, I am massively optimistic. I know, I know, uh, I, you know, I, 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 know. I, and, and actually I, I have a, uh, it's a good spot for a question that we got, uh, on, on Noster, which I, I thought was a good one. Uh, somebody was wondering, uh, what tangible tips do you have for transitioning your mindset to view the world outside of the current system? Uh, to, you know, uh, the person said, I've come to understand the need for this, but I have a hard time executing in the real world. Then they're almost there. Um, <laughs> so then, then uh, whoever wrote that, and you can reach out directly to me, and I'm happy to uh, kind of pull aside a uh, side conversation around uh, tangible tips. But once you can tr hold two opposing thoughts in your mind and understand what, what, the, what the base reality of the one thought, kind of the money printer, and what the world is going to turn into on, under that, and you could say this stays decentralized and secure and what does this do then you start to say then you start to make choices about which system do you want to give more energy to and as you start to realize it, uh, i said it early in our conversation um why why in 5000 years of human history we're always deceived and that we make we we make the system the entire world is is out of our thoughts and actions is it doesn't just happen to us. We are part of the thing that makes, <laughs> that informs the world. So if we're part of the thing that always has concentrated the, this before, then what I would argue is these two systems, the one that's, that you're measuring from, typically most people are measuring from, is, is really strong in its hold over you without you knowing it. But the question that that person just asked is, I now start to see them. Once you start to see them and you can hold both thoughts in your head, now you can move intentionally some more action into the new system. And that, and that might be if you're spending, if you just understand it now and you hold Bitcoin in self-custody and you're just, it depends where you are on, on, on the paradigm, but you'll, you might want to run a node. That might be your next step. You might want to go to some meetups and meet other people. You might want to meet some of the developers that are working in this in the system. And as you connect with those people, you're going to see opportunities everywhere because the world's full of massive problems as we transition, which creates opportunities for those that are leading the tra transition. So, so there's just so much abundance once you start to unlock what this new world is actually emerging and what the, what that looks like that you'll probably want to spend more time. And the question is, how do I start? What's an open decentralized permissionless protocol? You just go, you just start. Um, it, and it, 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 that might seem super simple, but it is that simple. You just, you could write an article, you could share on Noster, you could, um, you could do what Walker's doing, you create a pocket podcast. There's nothing stopping you from doing whatever. You could create a business that brings value to tens of people or billions of people. You could start your own Fediment to help other people understand a Fedi. You could do all sorts of things. The key is just starting. I think that that is, is such good advice. And this, it answers uh, one of the other questions that somebody had as well, which was for plebs who aren't engineers or entrepreneurs, what, how can you get involved in this? And, and that's the answer is just, just start. And you may not think you're an entrepreneur also, but Perhaps you are, if you're willing to take on some risk and to try new things. If there's one thing I've learned about, uh, about Bitcoiners, it's that in person, especially when you get around Bitcoiners, like it is really a, it's an inspiring thing and you never know what might come out of it. You never know what conversation might spark something, but you, but you know, it is worthwhile to go and to meet people in person, you know, and, sure. and remain, remain, remain anonymous, do whatever you want there, respect your own privacy, reveal what you want. But it really does make a difference to meet folks in person. There's, uh, I tend to think there isn't anybody I meet who is, doesn't have a superpower at something that, that they're, they're so exceptional part of this. It might be a narrow thing that they're so great at that I'm not great at. I, think, I look at that and go, wow. If I only had that little bit of that, and I try to incorporate all the people I meet and think, wow. What, what's, but those things are the things that are valued in the market today. Why wouldn't they be valued in the market tomorrow? So if you're, if you're thinking about the thing that you're really great at 
and you can provide value to somebody else or create, uh, whether it's creating your own company or provide value of doing the thing you're really great at within another company that's creating value for others, then go make those relationships or go start that company because, uh, and, and learn what it takes and kind of it, it, uh, iterate. But all of these skill sets are broadly needed as we reconstruct on top of Bitcoin too. And, and, you know, at the very least, go start a podcast because we, we need, we need to have a critical, uh, overwhelming mass of Bitcoin podcasts to get just completely, uh, just completely flood out all of the fiat finance podcasts that are out there. So until we well, can do that, until we can 51% attack, we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Look at you, Walker, and just think about the things you've learned just by writing, by, by doing the pod, podcast and, and, and like how, how much more at the front edge of learning this are, because you get to interview all of the things that are, uh, and, and it's just like in some ways you almost do it for free because not for anything else, just because it's so valuable in your own learning. I, and it's, it's true. Like I, I'm grateful to have a, a wonderful sponsor in, in Bitbox who is a open source, everything company. And that's great, but I, I was doing this for free and I would continue to do it for free, uh, independent of that, because you're exactly right. This is, I mean, nothing can get you inspired about the future, like talking to the people who are helping to build it yeah. and, and to realize that maybe you can have some small part in that, even if it's just helping to spread that message. And to anyone listening, you may think like, oh, I don't have that many followers on you know, on Noster or on Twitter or anything yet, but that's okay because even if the message that you're helping spread reaches a few more people who need to hear it, even if it just reaches within your own circles in your personal life, that's a really powerful thing. But it start it has to start with you taking some sort of action. And you know, the journey journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Like it's true, you just have to start. Yeah, at, at least that's my own rec uh, um, recommendation, or um, or what you could say feeling of of what i've got from it by do by putting all of my energy in it removing my energy from the existing system and moving my energy to this it's just been a mere reflection of abundance it's just all it's it, it just all is flooding it's, i can't believe i get to do what i get to do with the people i get to do uh do it with it's just so unreal and i wouldn't have known that before i took the step it it's a beautiful thing and you know, Jeff, I want to be want to be conscious of your time here. Do you have time for uh, one yeah, more yeah. question? Uh, okay, because I I realize we didn't get a chance to talk about Noster, and I I would be remiss if if I didn't uh, if I didn't at least talk about it a little bit with you because you have been somebody who has been active on Noster from very early on. You clearly saw the potential in this. I've noticed your. You're still somewhat active on Twitter, but it's 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 no, toned down. You, you've been shifting much more your energy. It's been months, right, since you posted? I haven't, I haven't posted on Twitter in probably three months, four months. Yeah. yeah. So, so for folks, because I still see when uh, when I post about Noster on Twitter, I still see a lot of people, Bitcoiners too, who by all rights should be some of the first to get why Noster is such an important protocol for free and open communication there still seems to be a piece missing. Do you think that this is just a matter of uh, not filling, not you know, meeting their specific needs that they have yet? Do you think that what is the next wave of adoption look like for Noster? Is it by force because of, you know, do people get smart by force because of censorship, because of crackdowns on centralized platforms? Or is it because of all the things that are being built out in the ecosystem within Noster because of that interoperability? Okay. A, a, a combination. So Noster, Fetty, uh, eCash, Lightning, all of these things come together to create something different than you can even imagine today. So much more val valuable. And so when you're competing, let's just say Noster as a Twitter clone where it, where it started. So you have, you, you have an advantage that nobody can shut you off. You have a early network, um, and you'd have to be pretty visionary to be able to go spend all of your time there, even de developers and going to, uh, to build there to see what that, that was. And then you, and then to move all of your time there when, when, when everybody else is on a different platform, you wouldn't get the same feedback. So it would be less valuable, even though, so you would have to, you would have to value 
the ability not to get shut off way higher than the utility value of all your network. Right. So what did I have to do? What did I have to do by leaving Twitter? I gave up 370,000 people that followed all, all of my stuff and retweeted and ever and I just said, see ya. Um, I'm spending all my time here now, uh, now because I wanted to give my energy to the, the to the world I want to, to see emerge. Now I don't, judge anybody for not wanting to do that at their time. But you, what you're going to find is more and more people are going to make that choice either by force or by, uh, not by force, but by realizing the center, the risks of centralization and what's happening. And Elon isn't a God. The, the, that's the, the, um, and they're going to start to, uh, to, to move their time over, uh, over to something that's, that's like this or by, all of the development that's happening that's going to provide like 10 or 100x better value than Twitter can provide because because open open protocols win because all of the development is interchangeable with it and so the, the p jigsaw piece of puzzles that other people build on and extend the functionality and so we're really early in that in that happening and I would I, would, I said this a long time ago, I think, really early. Um, I hacked Twitter when it was early. I said this in my book. I wrote a blog post that said why every CEO must be on, on Twitter. And then, every, and then I was on the front page of Twitter for two months, along with 10 other CEOs, um, including Bill Gates and others. And I was the only name that didn't belong on that list. <laughs> because because they needed people to reference the platform, and that and those things are the things that grew Twitter, and then more people there, more conversations there. Everybody wanted to be there, and everybody raced in. So, so by being early and doing that, you provide tons of people social proof that you're one of the people pe other people should follow, and so that just kept on growing on Twitter, even if I did nothing. Like if you looked at the number of tweets I actually put out over the years versus what most people put out versus the follower ratio, it's a staggering follower to tweet ratio, which either means one of two things. I hacked it or the <laughs> content was valuable. Maybe, <laughs> um, maybe a little bit of both, yeah. um, <laughs> but, um, but the, so what does that mean on, uh, on Noster early on? If you provide value, you can create an incredible outsized return because people will follow people will follow you and then as more people join the network they'll look to people who are providing value and they'll they'll move more and more to you and you'll have you have something that but because it's at the protocol level no one can ever take those followers away from you no one can ever take your content away from you the the clients are, are competing for you so all of the protocol development and all of the client development is in service of you and you're, and you're oh, the really be a really good steward, be really helpful, be help other people and you'll build a really big audience in this, in this network. And, and as, and you can already see it in Noster today, if you go for here versus a year ago, right. Or, um, where we are, you can see how much more, before you had to go back and forth to Twitter to see what was going on. Now you don't. Yeah, it's, it's true. And the pace of development on Noster has just been insane. N not just from like a, a, a usability of Twitter clones perspective, which, which is also true, but from a building out all sorts of different things like, you know, uh, uh, Pablo building out like Wikifredia and, and, and highlighter and these things that are just like truly amazing, like these incredible tools and that they, they just didn't exist a year ago and now they're there and people are using them and they're very useful and they're easy to use and getting easier to use. Yeah. And like, it's, it's amazing to like kind of watch this happen in real time. And I feel very, uh, very privileged to be, uh, you know, a small part in this, in this growing network, but it's a, it's a, it's a you're, good place you're, to you're, be. You're the nostrich. Well, this is like, true. Yeah, <laughs> not a small part. You're big. We're, a big, like, we're, you we're all the that. nostrich though. Yeah, but, but it's really, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cool to watch this emerge and all the people that you've been, 
been building with kind of emerge with it. It's, it's just awesome. Yeah, it, it was a it was a very surreal moment when all of a sudden I, I created a I was like, okay, you know, mid journey, create me a, a, a purple ostrich. I actually asked it to give me an ostrich with three heads because I wanted to have a Hydra type visualization yeah. of an ostrich. Mid journey screwed up. It just gave me one head. But I was like, well, this one looks pretty good. I guess I'll use this. And then all of a sudden, you see Jack tweeting this out. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay, I guess this is just a uh, we're going with this now. It's a purple ostrich. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> because JB 55 Will Casserin, the Damas creator, wrote a, a GPT bot within Noster that I asked to write me a, a joke about Noster. And it was a terrible joke. What do you call a nosy ostrich? An ostrich. And like, it's just funny. Like things just happen. And then all of a sudden they stick. And then all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people using it and building incredible stuff on it. And I'm, I'm grateful to developers who have shifted their time and attention to Noster because that's what makes it better. Totally. Like, it's incredible. But Noster is a, a, a good note to end on. Last question. This is a completely non sequitur, but are you reading anything right now or perhaps working on your next book? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know you probably just, get that a lot, I, but yeah, I just started writing on a new book. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and there's going to be some coming out. I'm helping with kind of in behind scenes, some that are coming out, but it's just, this is such a deep journey and where this goes and the new system change and what this means. And, and what I find one of the biggest, uh, um, blocks blocks for most people is whatever their baggage they're holding from the existing system they're attaching that to what this new system looks like um so uh, so i'm uh anyways i'm gonna i'm going to write a uh, book that goes really deep on where we're going in the future based on based on this being decentralized secure and how it gets there well i'm i'm excited Do, is it a do you view it as a continuation of the price of tomorrow or a completely different kind of paradigm yeah, so, you're trying to operate so, under? So, so, um, if I'm being honest and the price of tomorrow, um, do you, I don't know if you even know this. I never read any Austrian economics before about reading the price of tomorrow. I, I didn't, a lot of the stuff that, that, uh, that people talk about these, that the, the, you could see through different lenses through history. I just came to the same conclusion just through this same free market and the technology lens in a, in a different, in a different way. And then just realized how fast technology was going to move in the future and how bad and how critical it was. We had decentralized and secure money that or a uh, protocol so that prices could fall and we could achieve human abundance out of the free market. So, but you remember in, in the book, I, explained a lot about the problem. I explained what would happen us versus them as this. So you could look at it today and it's just, it's been perfect at describing how yeah. systems would, uh, would emerge. Um, and as they fought against each other, but I, but I only put Bitcoin in at the, uh, as a paragraph at the end, because I felt it were two things. I wasn't sure yet on Bitcoin. I, I had, at that time, I had some Bitcoin, but I and I, I was doing it, buying a lot more during writing the book because I was more sure. But I still thought it had a five percent probability of failure in time. And and then and so, I wanted to people to understand the problem, so they could understand the solution. And then I went from that time and you can probably see even my transition through a podcast over years and my writing over years, I've gotten way, way deeper under what this means, like way deeper, um, what this means and why it, why I think it will stay decentralized and secure, but actually what it requires to stay decentralized and secure, um, and what that, what that looks like. And so it's probably a part two of, so I, I effectively, I left the book at the problem statement and, and a tiny little bit about what the future could look like. And now I want to dig into what the future does look like or is imposed by the new rules of the new operating system. It sounds like it'll be a, a message of hope then. Very, very much so. Very much so. It, it, it's a message for, it, you could keep coming back to, to, to this in each of us. If we're responsible for the world we create and we're living mostly in a fiat world that we know is extractive, then who do we have to blame? Yeah. Well, ourselves. Only ourselves. Our, so, so 
so and and there is no one else there is no they right there is no it's it, the, the the governments that we say are stealing our power could only steal our power if we gave it to them through doing that and 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 then inside there you could find a whole bunch of allies that hated government so much that we're doing the same thing that would love you and make you feel really great by making that system stronger over you that extracts from you and and that would be what it would be normal that would be a total normal reaction for from all the population um it would be normal for you it would be normal for me so how do you fight that power if we make this a, you have to intentionally move your time and energy to the system you want to you want to th thrive and it doesn't have to be the entire world doing it it has to be a vigilant <laughs> number of people that are building that are providing hope so so imagine being stuck in fear in this and and then and then changing to hope <laughs> truth abundance so you know this right you know what it looks like in this but most people don't but as you move more and more of your time into the system you see it more and more and the, and then you're you're helping the other entrepreneurs if you're spending in bitcoin you're helping people uh people you can always buy more bitcoin right after uh, after spending but you're helping accelerate the ecosystem so i'd say so if if we truly are responsible for the world we see how could we blame anybody else if the world if we're mostly pricing in a us dollar um and and reinforcing a, a system of extraction from us how could we how could we possibly blame someone else it's us <laughs> that's i hope that that statement causes some introspection on behalf of anyone listening to this because it is ultimately we are the only ones responsible for our own decisions and we can make whatever excuses we want but if our decisions and our actions propagate the very thing that we are uh, supposedly trying to get around and create a new system around that is parallel to this and different and divergent and gives us a different future. But if we're not actually walking the walk and we're just talking the talk, well, we've only got ourselves to blame when things don't turn out the way we like. Yeah. And then, and then you could do that in one of two ways. You could yell at everyone else who's not doing it. You <laughs> could find, you could understand you were a hypocrite one day and that you moved your time and you made the same change. And then you could, from there, you could either say all of those stupid people that are over there and you could push them away further, or you could realize you were one of them two days ago, two years ago, <laughs> and you could realize that everybody needs to make this choice. And how do, would they make that choice? They'd probably make that choice by seeing this as a hopeful, truthful, abundant <laughs> community. They'd probably make, they, they, you don't move from fear to more fear. You move from fear to hope. And so, so. And, and when I say that, I'm not judging anybody who wants to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> like all the ideas, all of these ideas, they're, they're really good. I'm just saying for me, that's why I talk kind of in, in this way. I know, for, I know fully well I didn't know this five years ago, at least at this level. And I know what it took and unwiring all of, all, all, all of this to be able to come to, come to where I wanted to put my energy and uh, and that was it, 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 it takes time it takes time as you build a new mental model of, of where the future is going well I think that's a, a fantastically hopeful uh, and compassionate note to end on uh, Jeff is there anywhere you want to send people uh, for this yeah, find a, you on I, I Noster I say this on podcast so, so forgive me if you've heard a whole bunch of them jeffbooth.ca um, and I only say that is because um if I'm on a social network, most I'm not on any social networks anymore. I think I'm still on LinkedIn, but I don't spend any time on uh, on it. And I'm, uh, I think I still have my tw I have my Twitter account, but I don't spend any time on it. But there will not, uh, unless the social network is on my website, which my pub key is on my website. It's not me. And there's so many scammers. I will never ask you for money. So if, if you see a, a Jeff Booth impersonators on some, uh, on some social network asking you for money, it's not me.
You mean that wasn't you I sent my two Bitcoin to expecting? To be, oh, darn. Okay. Shoot. Well, there's, I, there's somebody verified as me on Instagram. Oh, there, God. There's like, there's, it's like, it's outrageous. Oh, it, actually the, show, it, it, it proves why, it also proves why um, the cryptography is so, is so important in the new social graph that was being built and, and the privacy of that. So it, actually, if you extend that to Fetty, um, like I'm going to create my own federation my, 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 myself for a close group of friends that you, you'll know for sure. Maybe. I mean, if there's a spot in that federation, uh, it of sounds course. like a federation yeah, I'd want to be <laughs> yeah. in. Well, well, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your scarce time. This was enlightening as always uh, and looking forward to the next time we get the chance to do this, hopefully in the flesh. Until then, thanks so much and uh, and keep keep encouraging people because I think you bring a lot of inspiration and optimism to folks and uh, we need more of that in this world. Right back at you, my friend. <laughs> And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Talk episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. If you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, head to bitcoinpodcast.net slash sponsor. If you're enjoying The Bitcoin Podcast, consider giving the show a five-star review wherever you listen or sharing the show with your friends, family, and strangers on the internet. Or don't, Bitcoin doesn't care, but I always appreciate it. You can find me on Noster by going to primal.net slash walker. If you want to follow the Bitcoin podcast on Twitter, go to at titcoin podcast and at walker america. You can also find the video version of this podcast at youtube.com slash at walker america and at walker america on rumble. Or just go to bitcoinpodcast.net slash podcast and find links everywhere. Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million, but Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free. Bitcoin.